Well, welcome to this special World Encephalitis Day edition of the Encephalitis Podcast with me, your host, Dr. Avery Easton. The next 24 hours are very exciting for everyone at the Encephalitis Society for two main reasons. First, we've got World Encephalitis Day on the 22nd of February. Hundreds of hours have gone into this year's campaign, which will all come to fruition on Tuesday, where I will be speaking to the media alongside some of our wonderful members. And we hope all of you listening right now will be going red for wed on your social media by um, wearing red and posting using the hashtag red for wed. You can see I have already started this trend for you to follow. As always, if you want to find out more, visit worldencephalitisday.org for more information or visit any of our social media channels. You can find more details in the description as well that goes with this podcast. Our second reason for excitement is the publication of our Global Encephalitis Review and Gap Analysis, authored by a key group of people dedicated to changing the landscape of encephalitis around the world. They are Julia Granerod, Alina Ellerington, Tom Solomon, Nick Davies, Benedict Michael and my good self. Encephalitis, an in-depth review and gap analysis of key variables affecting global disease burden, to give you its full name, is a 160 page report which looks at a range of difficulties and solutions to the worldwide impact of encephalitis. This is something that we've been working on for two years and is something which could, or rather can, save lives and improve the treatment and aftercare of millions of people today and in the future. We're currently in discussion with the World Health Organization and other stakeholders, and we'll be meeting with them this spring, along with a range of other people to discuss the report and the ways in which we can move forward into action some of the report's findings. But this brings me to today's guest, which is Dr. Julia Granerod, who was the lead author of the report. Julia is an epidemiologist, which is a person who investigates the patterns and causes of disease and injury, and is someone who we all know very well at the Encephalitis Society. She was a member of our scientific advisory panel for several years, and when the idea of this report came up, she was the first person that we thought of to lead authorship of this document. So, Welcome to the Encephalitis podcast, Julia. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you came to be involved with the Encephalitis Society? Hi, Ava. Hi, everyone. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here to discuss what I think is a really important milestone in the global fight against encephalitis. Um, A bit about myself. I'm a scientist. Um, I first trained in microbiology with an emphasis on tropical diseases before doing my PhD at the London, in epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, I worked for 13 years in clinical research and public health at what is now called the UK Health Security Agency, but was at that time called Health Protection Agency and then Public Health England. Um, during my time there, I became involved in discussions about setting up a national study to investigate the causes of encephalitis. And this is exactly what we went on to do. And this is where my collaboration with you, Ava, and the Encephalitis Society started. Um, And you were involved in the study from start to finish. And I've also been involved in subsequent studies that have happened on the back of that work. Um, In 2017, I set up on my own as an independent consultant. And I'm delighted that I'm still involved in encephalitis and I'm still involved with working with you. And I hope that that continues into the future. Yeah, Um, it has, I got, I hadn't realized it had all been that long. Um, But what is it about encephalitis that led you to focus on it as part of your career? So, well, you can see 20 years later, I'm still here working in the field. Um, I'm very passionate about it. And I think there are three main factors that have led me to focus on it. Um, I'll talk a bit more about them. But I think, one, it's a devastating condition with far reaching impact. Two, despite the devastating impact, it has been neglected to a certain extent. And three, there are preventative measures and treatments available for certain causes. Um, So in terms of the devastating impact, the mortality rate varies, but it can be up to 40%, depending on the cause, 
the health of the individual and the treatment that's been given. And those, but those who do survive often have long lasting problems that affect memory, cognitive function, uh, inhibition behavior, and also some struggle with epilepsy and level, levels of fatigue so great that you know, they can't return to work, they can't return to education. And effective families often describe you know, losing the person that they once knew. Um, but despite this devastating impact, for many years, the understanding of the condition has been poor relative to that of other neurological conditions. And encephalitis has often been classified as a rare disease. Um, however, in many countries, encephalitis has a higher incidence than motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, and bacterial meningitis. And I think really importantly, there are preventative measures and treatments available for certain causes. And I think that coupled with the devastating impact has given me the added imp impetus to try and make a difference, really. Yeah, I think that's a great summary. Um, uh, and I think it's probably for all of those reasons that we're, we're all still here um, all of these years later. Um, we're all super excited uh, about the, the new report. Um, uh, it's full title again, um, which all sounds very grand, Encephalitis, an in-depth review and gap analysis of key variables affecting global disease burden. But can you give um, listeners um, kind of a simple overview of, of what your task was? Sure, yeah, it is very exciting times. Um, my task as the first author of re re the report was to conduct a detailed analysis of the current global situation of encephalitis. So we looked at things like cause, uh, mortality, morbidity, uh, prevention, treatment, diagnostic surveillance. And my task was to uncover, uncover where we are at in terms of those variables in different settings around the world and where the gaps are. And the ultimate aim then is to turn those gaps into action that can make an impact on the future global disease burden. Yeah, it's a, it was a mammoth mm. task. I think, you know, mm. um, I listen to you now um, and I remember <laughs> when we came up with you know, this idea. I mean, nobody's ever done this before and there's a reason for that, right? Um, yeah. But what was involved in, in putting it together? So you're right, it was a huge task and it involved... Firstly, carrying out an extensive search of the scientific and medical literature to look for all relevant academic papers relating to each of those areas of interest. Um, in addition, I searched the internet for grey literature, which is basically information that's produced outside of the normal publishing channels, um, including, for example, reports, uh, policy documents, you know, government documents, etc. And uh, then for areas where I found very little information, I contacted relevant specialists in the field to ask if they were aware of the present situation. So we're launching uh, the report, we're going live with it for World Encephalitis Day, uh, and it, that launch is being announced in The Lancet Neurology. Um, it must be really fulfilling um, to be able to feel that we're finally sharing it with, with the public. Yeah, it is. I'm so delighted to share this report. As you said earlier, it's been a work in progress since, you know, 2019. And it's so nice to finally see it come to fruition and have the potential to greatly impact on people's lives and livelihoods in the future. Yeah, so I, I'm really proud. Yeah, I, I am too. It's, it's going to be our lasting legacy, Julia, yeah. to <laughs> society, whatever comes next. Um, <laughs> What was your main takeaway when you, you'd finished all of this work, which I know took you um, many, many months? Um, and, and actually, um, I do at this point just want to acknowledge um, the funder who, who we won't name, but uh, somebody mm -hmm. gave us a lot of money to get this piece of work done. They don't normally fund research, but as usual, we managed to persuade them and they know who they are. So thank you very much. But but what was your main takeaway when, when you'd finished? What in your mind were the key findings of the report? So that's a really difficult question. As, as you know, there were so many key findings and so many important findings. And I think to a certain extent, it depends where you're looking as the key findings will differ by location. So like in Europe, the key findings are very different to what they would be in other parts of the world. Um, but if I had to choose a few, 
and, and I will go into a bit more detail in a minute, I would probably say one is the evident discrepancy in the global availability of diagnostic tests and treatments for encephalitis. Two, it's the inequity in the number of neurologists observed across some countries in different income groups. And three is that although vaccines exist to prevent encephalitis, they're not always being used optimally. Yeah. Those are my three main things. Um, and just to elaborate a bit more. So in terms of the availability of diagnostic testing and treatment, so as you know, the two most common known causes of encephalitis are herpes simplex virus and autoantibodies, so antibodies against the self. Uh, both have reliable diagnostic tests available and both have treatments available that are effective if they're instigated early enough. Um, and so if you look at the global situation, both in terms of for diagnostics for both of them, and for the treatment of herpes and cephalitis, they're widely available in Europe, in the US and in Australia. The variability is quite patchy and variable in Asia. And then if you look at Africa and South America, there is a lack of, of tests, treatments or information. Um, in terms of inequity in the neurological workforce, well, there's a low density of neurologists, often in the areas with the highest disease burden. Um, and in some countries, so mainly in like Africa and in the Pacific Islands, there is absolutely no neurologist at all. Um, vaccination, although vaccinations exist to prevent certain causes, as I said, they're not always being used optimally. So the estimated average global coverage of a second dose of measles containing vaccine is 71%. And this compares to the 95% that's recommended by the WHO. Um, and in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they have yet to introduce a second dose. Um, if you look closer to home with TBE or tick-borne encephalitis, um, many European countries where their tick-borne encephalitis most commonly occurs, there is some form of vaccine policy in place, but sometimes in, in places with, where um, the disease is highly endemic, there's a low rate of vaccine uptake. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna come, come back to a couple of those points as well, particularly the lack of neurologists and also um, encephalitis prevention. Um, before I do, was, was there anything, was the one statistic or anything that really stood out for you at all? Yeah, I think I must say I was a bit surprised by the complete lack of neurologists in some parts of the world. And, you know, almost three quarters of countries in Australia, Oceania, so mainly the Pacific Islands, and uh, a fifth of countries in Africa report, reported no neurologists. Yeah, so I think that was like one of the statistics that really hit home. Yeah, um, it really hit home for me uh, as well, um, you know, this this lack of, of neurology in many of the low to middle income countries. Um, and also some of the, the other things that you described there around uh, diagnosis and treatment, you know, at the last uh, encephalitis conference, we, we heard, you know, a very moving report from uh, Senegal where they don't have things that we take for granted, um, you know, like intravenous acyclovir and people dying needlessly yeah. because they simply can't give them the drugs. And even if the drugs are available, people can't afford to buy them to, to, yeah. to be, um, to actually have the treatment. Yeah. But going back to this issue um, of neurologists, you know, how crucial are neurologists, mm -hmm. for, those, for those listeners that don't know, how crucial are neurologists to the treatment of people who are recovering um, from encephalitis? So I think neurologists are essential. Firstly, to take a step back from the treatment, I think they're really important in the early stages to make a diagnosis and to you know, order the correct test to be carried out because um, the presenting symptoms of encephalitis are very nonspecific and often overlap with those of other diseases like stroke and brain tumors. And it's often not clear when patients first present if it's encephalitis or not and it's hard to recognize. So I think they're very important in the diagnostic stage. And then, as you say, they're really important to the treatment of people who are recovering from encephalitis by providing the appropriate neurological care, by working with other specialists to set up, you know, proper rehabilitation programs to help with patient recovery and to provide patients with tools to help cope with their newfound deficits. 
And also, I think not to be underestimated also, and particularly in low income countries, is that neurologists are also really important for the provision of training and support and supervision for other healthcare providers, like, um, you know, nurses, primary care teams and medical students. Yeah. So they are essential, I think. They are. Reasons. They are indeed, and we don't we don't have enough of them. Um, you, you talked a bit about encephalitis and prevention. We were talking about vaccines that can prevent people from catching um, uh, encephalitis, such as Japanese encephalitis and tick-borne encephalitis. And of course, in many ways, prevention is the gold standard. If we can stop people getting this awful condition, then that's that's got to be um, a primary aim for us. Um, but um, how are we generally, do you think, with preventative measures for these types of encephalitis? I mean, you touched upon it a minute ago, um, and, and, and I think you kind of alluded to some countries being better than others, but, but what's your take on this? So, as I said, you know, it's really good in some countries and not suboptimal in other countries. And, uh, you know, the, so the main types of encephalitides that can be prevented by vaccination include Japanese encephalitis, tick-borne encephalitis, rabies, measles, and varizoster virus. Um, and if I take, say, Japanese encephalitis as an example, the World Health Organization recommends that Japanese encephalitis vaccination is included in the national immunization program for all countries where JE is recognized as a public health priority. At present, 62% of countries, so almost two thirds of countries, with a Japanese encephalitis virus transmission risk have a, a immunization program. Now, some countries with that risk have decided against the program simply because, you know, they only experience rare sporadic cases and it's not cost effective to implement it into the national policy. But other countries, you know, lack a vaccine program because of non-functional health facilities and lack of vaccine availability like, yeah. you know, pop in the, into the Pacific Islands. Yeah. Um, if we look at tick-borne encephalitis as another example, the WHO recommends that tick-borne encephalitis vaccination be offered to the whole population in areas where it's highly endemic and in specific risk groups in areas where it's, you know, moderate or, or low incidence. Uh, and many, as I said, many European countries have some form of policy but sometimes in areas that are highly endemic, that have high incidence rates, high uh, you know, levels of disease, the vaccine uptake is low. Yeah. So and it is very variable. Yeah. And this is all before we even get into the, the, the other additional issue of travel health information and people traveling to these countries um, and not getting the vaccinations, which, which is a whole other um, issue and one that we do, again, touch upon um, in the report. Um, the report also provides recommended solutions to encephalitis problems in, in different countries um, as best we, we could anyway. Um, there are a lot of problems, as we've already been describing, um, and a lot of solutions suggested. But are they all longer term measures or do we have some that you think can, we can achieve fairly quickly? So I think there are some that we can achieve relatively quickly. And I think the instances where, for example, the correct tool, so be it a, a vaccine or a diagnostic test is already present and being used in a setting, but not optimally is where we can probably make the difference quickly. Um, an example that comes to mind is improving vaccine coverage for you know, measles or TBE vaccine in countries where they're already being implemented. And I think, you know, that those sorts of things can be achieved much more quickly than, you know, say, implementing a whole new vaccine program in, a, in an area where it doesn't already exist. Um, alternatively, like in, in Europe, say, where IVA Cyclovir for the treatment of herpes and cephalitis is already widely available, but it's not being used optimally, you know, promoting adherence to recommended guidelines, say, for you know, early initiation and for the adequate duration would be valuable and could be achieved quite quickly. Yeah, those are those are good points. And I think it's heartening, isn't it? That I mean, we know that this is going to be a long journey, um, yeah. you know, working with people to to implement some of the um, uh, solutions that, that we hope that we found to some of the, the problems. But I think 
you know, the landscape is always shifting um, in encephalitis. I know that I've been doing it a long time. When I first started, um, all encephalitis, or at least we thought all encephalitis was infectious. Now, of course, we know um, that there are a vast range of, of autoimmune triggers. So, so I know only too well about this shifting landscape of encephalitis, which is probably why I'm still here. But um, so new issues are emerging um, all the time. Will you, are you planning on revisiting the report at all? Yeah, you know, that's a really good point. It will, this report will be updated on an annual basis. And because as you say, with the shifting landscape in terms of, you know, climate change resulting in the wider spread of geographic, you know, uh, causative agents, identification of new causes altogether, it's important to incorporate new pertinent information when it becomes available. Yeah. Oh, that's it's so good. I mean, like you, I share that vision that this wasn't something that was just going to sit on a shelf and get dusty. I no. think it's so important. And anyway, we put too much work into it, right? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Blood, <laughs> sweat and tears, Ava. <laughs> um, uh, we've shared, uh, obviously, we reached out to the, the World Health Organization uh, when we concluded this report. Um, and they were, you know, bless them, very interested in discussing um, the report with us, along with other stakeholders. Um, and we're hoping to address some of the concerns with hopefully what will be a consortium, uh, including the World Health Organization of people that can help us really make a difference going forward. Um, but what are the next steps and, and your hopes for this? So my hope is that this report is the first step in a global commitment to reduce the incidence of and mortality and morbidity from encephalitis. And, you know, I hope we hope we can bring together, you know, leading global health organizations, public health bodies and policymakers, who, as you say, are best placed to steer the findings of this report and help us build a global response that will result in preventing and reducing the impact of encephalitis around the world. And so our next step is gonna to be to hold a preparatory consultation with selected stakeholders and you know, to present the findings of the report and listen openly to their perspectives to further discussions before taking it to a larger stakeholder consultation where we'll, we'll invite perspectives from a wider group. Yeah, it's really exciting. And so I think we've got our, our first, that preparatory meeting in, in March, haven't we? And the, the yeah. big global one in June. So watch this space yeah. people, lots of exciting mm -hmm. stuff coming up. Look, we come, we're coming towards the end of this podcast, Julia. Is there anything else that you want to say or that you even that you wish that I'd asked you before we finish up? Yeah, firstly, I'd like to say a huge thanks to yourself and the Encephalitis Society, you know, for initiating this project, for securing the funding and for driving this important work forward. You know, it's so important. And my final comment is that I really hope that this report acts as a catalyst for change and that we can elevate encephalitis onto the global platform and to really make a difference. Yeah, I share those views. And thanks for the thanks for the thank you as well. They're always appreciated. Um, we've covered an awful lot. We're so grateful to you for taking the time to chat with us, Julia. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you. If you'd like to read the report and find out more, look for the link in the descriptions of this edition of the Encephalitis podcast. The Encephalitis Society remains at your service as always. So if you need support or information, our teams are there for you. Go to encephalitis.info for contact details or to chat online with any of the team. We hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. And as always, if you can support our life-saving work, we would be extremely grateful. Please visit encephalitis.info forward slash donate. And all that leaves me to say now is to wish everyone a very happy World Encephalitis Day. Thank <laughs> you.